Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here today to hear Professor Gillen speak on affluence and influence. Uh, my name is Dan Weeks. I'm a fellow at the Saffer Center for Ethics, uh, the sponsor of tonight's talk, and I'm honored to make an introduction. Um, so if you'll bear with me, uh, I'll say good afternoon again, my fellow elites. In hallowed halls like this, it's not uncommon to assume, whether we speak it out loud or not, that the mass of the American people are not particularly well suited to self-governance. Having studied the ancient Greeks, uh, we know that we're in good company. Hail to the philosopher king. But our speaker this afternoon has constructed the models, he's assembled the data, he's poured over both the policy preferences of the public in surveys of hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens, as well as the roll call votes of senators over several years, and stacks of data sets later, he has found that that debate over Americans' fitness to self-governance is, well, sort of mute. That is because we the people don't particularly govern, we the elites do. Uh, Professor Gillens writes, the stark inequalities in the responsiveness of policymakers to the preferences of more and less advantaged Americans imply a failure of democratic governance. His careful research has made it abundantly clear that if the preferences of the public at large were honestly represented by our elected so-called representatives, government policy would change in profound ways we would, be a more we would have a more progressive tax system, uh, stricter corporate regulation, higher minimum wage, as well as some other changes that we might not find as favorable as those. Uh, still, it does seem that Professor Gillens is an idealist. I quote from him again, the radical idea at the core of democracy is that the power to shape public policies should be widely and more or less equally shared among citizens. What's more, quote, however imperfect the public may be as a guardian of its own interests, it is a more certain guardian of those interests than any feasible alternative, the philosopher king being dead. If you'd permit me to, to moralize and, and be personal for just a moment, I've had the privilege of spending several weeks over the last few months on Greyhound buses traveling around different parts of the country trying to understand a bit uh, the human perspective on the issues of political inequality that Professor Gillens illuminates through a tremendous amount of data. And I believe that we here, um, many of us, I, I do believe democratic idealists, believe that something is profoundly wrong and that we are in a position to do something about it. The problems couldn't be more clear, as I think we'll hear in the next hour from the professor. Uh, but one thing I often found when I was interviewing folks in poverty uh, was that they tended to take a, a bit of a gloomy personal view, believing that much of it fell on their backs to make their lot in life better. Uh, that personal responsibility was perhaps the only uh, obligation. As I came out of those interviews, and perhaps some of you can relate, I, I was forced to confront the fact that we who have tremendous privilege, we who can call ourselves oftentimes elites, um, have an opportunity, if not an obligation, at least an opportunity to do something about this. In other words, Professor Gillen's research is not just an interesting illumination of a problem our country faces. It is a call to action, I believe. Uh, nobody says we must, but relative to the people whom Professor Gillens is writing about those who suffer because of the lack of political equality, people whom I had the good fortune of meeting and speaking with on my own travels. Um, we are in this hall very privileged, and we can, we, and thus we have an opportunity and even, I believe, a responsibility to take some personal stake in this problem of overcoming political inequality. So without further ado and with your with thanks for, for allowing me to, to moralize a little bit. Um, I, we're very privileged to hear from someone at the forefront of the political science research into this most important and pressing public policy question. And I look forward to, to learning more 
about how we both confront the reality, uh, realize and understand the reality, and respond to it uh, from Professor Gillens. Thank you so much, Professor Martin Gillens. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Marty Gillens. I teach in the politics department at Princeton University, and I want to thank the Safra Center, uh, Larry Lessig, and thank you, Dan, for that uh, very thoughtful introduction. Um, I want to start today by drawing your attention to some of the uh, more prominent policy changes and broader policy trends in the United States over the past few decades. Uh, if we think about something, say, like the repeal of the Glass-Steagall financial uh, regulations uh, during the Clinton years, um, you know, this was sort of emblematic and representative of a much broader trend over the past few decades in a more deregulatory direction, right, starting arguably with Carter and accelerating under Reagan and so on. Think about the Bush tax cuts of 2001 and 2002. Uh, prominent policy change that, again, is characteristic of a longer-term trend toward lower taxes and a less progressive uh, federal tax regime. Um, or NAFTA, right? NAFTA uh, signed under uh, Bush 41, ratified under Clinton. Uh, again, a characteristic of a long-term trend uh, toward a freer, more open uh, trade regime in the United States. Tariffs today are much lower than they were in the 1960s and 70s. And there's two important characteristics, <clears throat> excuse me, two important characteristics that all of those trends uh, and policy changes share. And one of them is that they were embraced in varying degrees, but, uh, but nevertheless with uh, varying degrees of enthusiasm by both political parties. And the other is that they were all considerably more popular among affluent Americans than among the less well-off. And as these examples suggest, there is a concern that uh, not just in these areas, but more broadly, right, that public policy in this country reflects the preferences, the wishes, and the interests of those who have means and not of the public in general. And this uh, concern, of course, has grown over time as income and wealth have become more concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Um, and as the cost of political campaigns and the apparent role of money in the political process has become uh, larger and more prominent over time. So I wrote this book, uh, Affluence and Influence, uh, in response to those kinds of concerns. Not because I doubted that affluent Americans had more ability to sway government policy than uh, less affluent uh, uh, citizens, um, but because I wanted to know how much more and how that inequality in representation, inequality in influence, has varied over time, how it varies across different sorts of policies, different domains of policy, what sort of political circumstances uh, contribute or ameliorate inequalities in representation, and so on. All right, so how could we answer those kinds of questions? Well, I'm a data analyst uh, by trade, and so for me that meant going out and collecting a lot of data, uh, which is one reason why the book was published a decade, more or less, uh, after I began this project. Uh, the data that I collected um, started with surveys uh, about policy preferences. So surveys that ask uh, the American public as a whole um, how they feel about a, the, an entire range of policies that are addressed at the federal level over a long period of time, and then looking at the outcomes of those policy issues. Right? What did, citizens of this country want their government to do and what, in fact, did government do uh, over the period of time that I've collected questions. And um, more specifically, I've got about 2,200 survey questions, um, each of which asks about some specific proposed policy change uh, to federal government policy. This is foreign and domestic policy, everything from uh, specific changes in abortion restrictions to uh, whether we should send troops to Bosnia, raising the minimum wage uh, to some specific amount, uh, and so on. So uh, I collected these questions. The core of my data um, and the, many of the analyses that I'll be talking about today uh, involve survey questions that were asked between 1981 and 2002. In addition, I supplemented that with survey questions from the mid-1960s, from the Johnson years, and from 2005 and 2006 in order to capture periods of 
unified Democratic or Republican Party control in Washington. And um, for each of these uh, proposed policy changes, I then coded, um, or people working uh, for me coded, um, and there were many of them over the years, uh, whether in fact that change had occurred within a four year window of the time that the question was posed. The core of my analysis then, and what you'll be seeing on the screen behind me over the next 45 minutes or so, is how strong is that association between the level of support for a particular policy change and the likelihood that that change would be adopted. And I can measure the strength of that association not only for the public as a whole, but for subgroups of Americans at different income levels. Question is, to what extent does greater support for a policy uh, associated with a higher probability of that policy being adopted? All right, before I get into the findings here, um, there's a number of questions that I want to raise and then set aside. And they're important questions, but well, I can't address everything today, but I don't want you to be like worrying about them over the next uh, 45 minutes. So I'll just put them out there and we can talk about them in the Q&A if you want. And one of those concerns something that Dan mentioned a minute ago, which is, are the public fit to govern, right? I I'm looking at the preferences expressed by Americans on surveys, and yet there's a whole body of literature in uh, public opinion um, that suggests that, as on the whole, the public doesn't have coherent uh, preferences, coherent uh, um, understanding and, uh, uh, and preferences um, on most policy issues. I don't tend to agree, but that's something we can talk about. I'm going to set it aside. Another set of uh, concerns for anyone doing this sort of work is how successful are we, assuming the public does have meaningful preferences, how successful are we at measuring those with surveys? All right, so concerns about question wording and survey context and so on. There's normative questions too, which I will uh, just mention and then set aside. For example, how desirable is it to have a strong link between what the public says we should be doing on some particular policy and what government does? Right? There's other models of representation, right? trustee models, right? where people are expected to elect a representative and then let them go and use their own best judgment and not necessarily adopt policies that are consistent with what their constituents prefer at any given point in time. And finally, a difficult question that um, political theorists have uh, grappled with for a long time concerns the desirability of equal influence or an equally strong link between preferences and policy. And there may be some individuals who are viewed as being uh, more informed or more suited toward uh, contributing to uh, sort of collective deliberation or collective decision making. Or it may be simply that some people care about some issues and others about other issues. And it makes more sense, some argue, to let people who care about policy in the Middle East have more influence on that, on that uh, domain of policy and people who care about education uh, or abortion or whatever it is. All right, so these are all interesting and important questions, some of which I touch on in the book. But I will not speak more about them uh, today unless you ask me uh, later on. All right, so um, my focus then, as I suggested, is the differential responsiveness right, of government policymakers to different income levels, people at different income levels. And the first thing to note, though, is that across many policies, we don't find differences in preferences. Right? So in roughly half of the questions in my data set, there are small or no differences across income levels in the preferences that are expressed on these surveys. So things like defense policy, at least most aspects of defense policy, environmental policy, I mean, the, the preferences expressed, of course, differ across different groups and individuals, but not across different income levels. Similarly, for things like the war on drugs, education spending, family leave policy, these are things where you get very similar levels of support for these kinds of policies uh, across the income level. All right, but then there's the other half of the uh, policy items that I've got in my data set, where people across income levels do differ. And Many of those differences can be uh, sort of summarized in, in three categories. The first is that affluent Americans tend to be much more market oriented in their policy preferences than the less well off. And we see that reflected across a range of different policy domains, including things like uh, trade policy, much more uh, so, sort of uh, supportive of free trade policies. Affluent Americans um, are less supportive of corporate regulation, 
as a general rule. Um, even things like school vouchers or Medicare HMOs, right, market-oriented uh, policies toward education or, or healthcare. These are all policies that are more popular uh, with better off Americans. So while they have conservative views on things like uh, regulation and trade, affluent Americans tend to be more liberal than the less well off on sort of social and moral issues, right? Things like abortion, school prayer, uh, gay rights, stem cell research, these kinds of things. And finally, as you would expect, affluent Americans prefer a less progressive tax structure. And that, uh, the evidence of that across a range of different kinds of taxes and, and proposed changes in uh, federal tax policy. Okay, so with that by way of introduction, let's take a look now at some data um, and start with the uh, relationship between policy preferences and policy outcomes for the public as a whole. Okay, so people across all income levels grouped together here. And what this chart shows is the probability on the vertical axis, the probability of a proposed policy change being adopted against on the horizontal axis, the proportion of survey respondents who support that proposed change. So in a democratic society, you would expect to see a positive slope to that relationship. And thankfully, we do see that indeed. Popular policies are more likely to be adopted than unpopular policies. Um, on the other hand, a few things to notice. First, a strong status quo bias. Right, so policies on the left side of the slide here that are quite unpopular almost never get adopted. On the other hand, policies up here on the right side um, that are quite popular only have about a 50 or 60 percent chance of being adopted. Okay, now that's not particularly surprising. It's consistent with a government which, after all, was designed uh, to make policy change difficult. Right, checks and balances, multiple veto points, supermajority requirements, and so on. Um, but, it, but it is relevant to uh, the, the kinds of um, outcomes that I'll be talking about. So strong status quo bias. Another thing to note is that there's no sort of like magic number where the proportion of the public supporting a policy uh, leads to some large sudden increase in the likelihood of that policy being adopted. And there's certainly not uh, such an increase around the 50% mark. Right? So which side uh, the majority comes down on, if it's a sort of a weak majority, matters little in terms of predicting whether that policy will be adopted. But the strength of the support or opposition is important. And in fact, as you see, the tails of this distribution on the left and right side um, show a steeper, a stronger relationship between uh, degree of support and likelihood of, uh, of adoption. Um, and then finally, at any given level of support, there's a range of outcomes, right? Some policies are adopted and, and, and others are not. And of course, that's not surprising and reflects, among other things, the fact that public preferences are only one factor that shape government policymaking, right? We've got interest groups, the costs of policies, which policymakers may have to take into account in ways that the public may not, um, even considerations of whether a policy is likely to be effective. Is it good policy or not? So there's a lot of other things going on besides uh, public preferences. All right, so here's the shape of the basic relationship. And to do the kind of statistical analysis that I'll be showing you uh, requires that I sort of put this data into a statistical model. And what I get out from that model is predicted probabilities, which I'm showing you in the black line here. And uh, this slide just says that my model does a pretty decent job of predicting the observed uh, likelihood of policies being adopted at these different levels of support. Okay, so now let's get into the meat of the matter, how these relationships differ for the preferences of people at different levels of the income distribution. And what I'm going to be doing for um, all of my analysis is looking at people at three income levels, the 10th, the 50th, and the 90th income percentiles. And I will call the people in those groups the poor, the middle class, and the affluent. And the reason I call people at the 90th percentile the affluent rather than the rich is because by most people's accounting, the 90th income percentile, while high relative to, well, 90% of the population, uh, is not rich. So in today's terms, if you earn about $140,000 in household income, then you're at the 90th income percentile. 
And um, it would be nice to know what like the truly rich uh, believe, but there aren't enough of them in these surveys. Uh, and even when they're there, we can't really tell who they are for other reasons. Um, but at any rate, uh, that's what I'm going to focus on. And we can talk later about how the inability to look at a higher uh, income level uh, might influence these results or, or our interpretations. All right, so as you can see, if we look separately at people with high, middle, and low incomes, we find, as expected, that the strength of this relationship, the association between what they want and what the government does, is greatest in, in the red line, right, for people at the 90th income percentile, somewhat weaker for people in the middle, and a bit weaker still for those at the bottom. But the differences don't look dramatic, and, um, and they're not. On the other hand, this analysis includes all of the policies in my data set, those on which people across income levels agree and those on which they don't. What we really care about, right, is what happens when preferences diverge, right? Then who has sway over government policymaking? And so we can run the same analysis but restrict the, uh, uh, the issues that are looked at, the policy questions that are examined, um, to those cases where there's a divergence of opinion. And if we do that for the high and low income Americans, you see a very different pattern. The preference policy link for people at the 90th percentile looks essentially the same. Right? It doesn't really matter if people below them agree or not. We see a similar strength of relationship. But for people at the bottom of the income distribution, well, that's a disturbingly flat line. Right? I mean, that means that the likelihood of a policy being adopted bears no relationship to whether they support or oppose that policy. Now, you might think, all right, well, maybe poor people in this country have sort of idiosyncratic views uh, that differ not only from what the affluent want, but from what the majority of the public prefers. All right, well, if that's the case, then a responsive majoritarian democracy would show perhaps something along these lines, right? It shouldn't respond to those idiosyncratic views. So instead, we can look at what happens when people at the middle income, uh, median income, diverge in their preferences from those at the top. And they don't do any better. So under typical circumstances, and I'll be talking about what atypical circumstances look like in a minute. But under typical circumstances, there's a strong responsiveness to the preferences of the affluent and virtually none to the preferences of the poor or the middle class. We can repeat this exercise, or I did repeat this exercise, at different income levels, um, not just the 10th, 50th, and 90th. And what you see is the same kind of a pattern, right? So this is showing you what happens when people at the 10th, 30th, 50th and 70th income percentiles, those first four bars on this side, uh, what, what the strength of their association between preferences and policies looks like when people at each of those different income levels uh, disagree or where their preferences diverge from those at the top. And then similarly, the four red bars are showing you the strength of the preference policy link for people at the top when preferences diverge from each of those other four income percentiles. And the story is very much the same. There's kind of a hint uh, it's not statistically significant, but there's a hint that maybe people at the 70th income percentile still have a bit of influence uh, when preferences diverge. But, uh, but on the whole, it does appear that responsiveness uh, typically is limited to people at the very top of the income distribution. Um, and I should point out that the height of these bars reflects the steepness of the uh, association that I was showing on the previous slides. So this is just the sort of numerical expression of that uh, based on the logistic regressions that uh, capture that strength of that relationship. All right, now, of course, this doesn't mean that poor people never get what they want from government, right? I mean, first of all, there's many policies on which we don't find differences or where the differences are minor uh, across the uh, income distribution. Um, it also doesn't mean that the affluent always get what they want, right? I mean, we saw a strong status quo bias, for example, and, and that was true as well for the preferences of the affluent as well as those of the public as a whole. Equally important is the fact that there are many policies which are disproportionately beneficial to lower income Americans, but which are strongly supported by people across the income distribution, right? So things like raising the minimum wage, uh, 
the earned income tax credit, uh, federal spending for education. And these are all policies that disproportionately benefit low-income Americans but are strongly supported, perhaps somewhat more strongly by those at the bottom, but nevertheless uh, with uh, strong majorities uh, favoring policy changes in those directions, even uh, at the high end of the income distribution. So we will see policies, and we do see policies, that are uh, beneficial to less well-off Americans. Um, and typically, those are policies, as I say, which are uh, also garner support uh, from uh, better off uh, citizens as well. OK, um, one of the things I look at in the book is how this pattern uh, varies across different issue domains. I look at foreign policy versus domestic policy, these sorts of social moral issues like abortion and gay rights, um, distinguish economic policies from sort of social welfare, uh, welfare state kinds of policies. And I won't go into details, but in general, the pattern is the same across all of those policy domains. So there are a few interesting exceptions. If you read the book, you'll find out what they are. But, um, uh, but in general, you see the same kind of relationships with strong responsiveness, or at least moderately strong responsiveness to the well-off, and little to no responsiveness to the middle class and the poor. All right, what I want to focus on uh, today, though, is how variations in political circumstances influence uh, the association between, policy, uh, between preferences and policy outcomes. Um, you might think, I thought, that the most important political circumstance would be which party controls the government. Right? The Democratic Party has long been viewed as sort of the champion of less well-off Americans, the Republicans, the party of business, and the well-to-do. Um, and there is, there is truth in that, and there is a very important, although limited, set of policies where we do see strong differences based on which party uh, is in control in Washington. And those include things like the minimum wage, right, which has tended, not always, but tended to go up uh, when Democrats uh, are in power and has rarely gone up when Republicans are in power. Similarly, um, tax progressivity, changes in the estate tax, and so on, do follow a strong partisan pattern. Um, but the notion that the Democratic Party is, in some broader sense, uh, the representative of less well-off Americans is not evident in my data. And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, first is that while it's true that the Democratic Party typically does align more with the preferences of the less well-off on economic and redistributive policies, it's the Republican Party that represents the interests of the less well-off on these sort of social and moral issues. And the other thing is that you know, both parties, as I suggested, have adopted a set of policies in these sort of broad areas of regulation and trade, for example, um, that are more consistent with the preferences of well-off Americans. So where there used to be more of a distinction between Democratic and Republican parties on things like trade and protectionism, uh, that's um, declined over the years. And then finally, even on these redistributive issues, uh, as I suggested, there's uh, less difference on some of these issues uh, across income uh, levels than you might expect, right? So things like the minimum wage or spending for education that get high support even among the well-off, and similarly things that are upwardly redistributive policies but nevertheless garner strong support among the poor, things like reducing or eliminating the estate tax, um, imposing work requirements on welfare recipients, um, things like that, and maybe we can talk later about uh, some of the reasons for that. Um, but it, nevertheless, it's very true, and it's one of the factors that contributes to the lack of what I expected to find, which was this association between party control and responsiveness to different uh, income levels. So the bottom line here, in, in, in terms of uh, partisan control, uh, at least in the sense of one party versus the other, is that the, there's just no evidence that the Democratic Party, uh, w w that when they're in power, that we see a difference in these relationships. It's very similar for uh, Republican periods of Republican and Democratic control. All right, well, I mentioned I have data that goes back to the 1960s, um, not continuously, but, um, uh, but one of the reasons I have is because I was interested in whether representational inequality has increased over time as economic inequality has grown. And the answer is that in some ways it has, but the story is more complicated than that. So let me show you the 
pattern of the strength of this link between preferences and policies across uh, the five presidents in my data set. Now, this is not what I was expecting to find, right? But very low levels of responsiveness, very low levels of uh, connection between public preferences and policy adoptions during the Johnson years, and the highest levels during George W. Bush's administration. Now, when I saw that, I thought, all right, there must be some kind of a coding error here that can't be right. <laughs> I mean, we all know that Bush, you know, came into office and moved policy in a direction to benefit uh, the rich. Um, you know, how can this be? Um, so, like a good social scientist, I looked very carefully and tried my hardest to make it go away. Um, I couldn't do it. Uh, I, I think that really is uh, reflective of what's going on. And uh, you can see these same patterns even more starkly when we look at uh, those issues on which preferences across income levels diverge the top pattern for the affluent and the poor, the bottom panel for the affluent and the middle class. Um, there's just no evidence of responsiveness to any income level under Johnson and a high degree of responsiveness to all income levels under George W. Bush. All right, what I want to do now is address this unexpected finding uh, in two ways. First, by identifying the sort of substance, the kinds of policies that are reflected in these different uh, strengths of relationship. Um, and then look at, in a more systematic way, at that, why it is that those policies and not others were adopted during those administrations. All right, so let's start with Johnson. Uh, during the Johnson years, um, which we, th I think, think, tend to think of for the sort of landmark domestic policies like Medicare and Medicaid and Great Society programs, there were many policies that were popular, and they tended to be popular s with similar levels of support across the income distribution. And those included things like Medicare, which was somewhat more popular among low-income than high-income individuals, but not dramatically so. Head Start, federal aid to education, increases in the minimum wage, uh, the Voting Rights Act, these were all policies adopted in the Johnson years that had high levels of public support. But there were a lot of policies adopted in those years that did not have high levels of public support, in fact had high levels of public opposition. And that opposition also tended to be shared by the less well-off as well as uh, the affluent Americans. So things like uh, components of the Great Society, like increased aid to cities, uh, increased housing aid, uh, increases in uh, welfare payments. Um, these were not popular even among people at the 10th income percentile, who, by the way, are typically too affluent, believe it or not, to qualify for at least most welfare programs. At any rate, uh, the role that plays is a topic for another day, but um, loosening of immigration uh, laws uh, in, uh, during the Johnson years, extremely unpopular. Uh, the Vietnam War, uh, the tax surcharge that was imposed to pay for it, and the escalation of the war itself, um, also unpopular. On the whole, the Johnson administration policies reflect a, um, a, a, a regime, a, um, a condition under which policymakers seem to be fairly indifferent to the preferences of the public. Right? These were, in large measure, core policy commitments of the Democratic Party, but not core policy commitments of the public at any particular income level, and certainly not uh, for the poor. That's not to say the Johnson administration didn't do important things policy-wise um, that benefited less well-off Americans. They certainly did. But it does not reflect a general effort to reflect the preferences of that group, that constituency, but rather to reflect uh, traditional, uh, as I say, Democratic Party uh, policy commitments. Now, the opposite situation to the Johnson years, both in time and in political circumstances, occurred during the first couple of years of George W. Bush's first term, so 2001 and 2002. So whereas in, in the Johnson years you had you know, strong democratic control, um, as well as lower level of economic inequality and strong unions, which is sort of what made me think I would see responsiveness to the less well off, uh, during the Bush years you had a very evenly divided Congress. Right, when Bush came into office in 2001, the Senate was split 50-50. Um, the Democrats then, when uh, Jim Jeffords uh, abandoned the Republican Party, uh, had a one-seat advantage. 
Republicans had a very small uh, seat advantage in the House. Republicans had lost seats in both houses of Congress in the 2000 election. And of course, uh, Bush had lost the popular vote in 2000 and uh, only uh, got into office by virtue of a Supreme Court decision. So there was a time of e very even division of Congress and considerable uncertainty about what the sort of political future held. Now, Bush um, was seen by me, um, as well as by many others, certainly those on the left, as being a very polarizing president. And in some ways he was, um, but not in all of the ways that we might think. So if we're thinking about how people responded to Bush in terms of their partisanship, it's true, uh, compared to his predecessors, which is what the uh, top uh, graph here is showing, um, people were more divided uh, by party ID on approval of President Bush than they had been of his predecessors. But in terms of income, Bush was not a polarizing figure. Right? If you wanted to know whether people approved or disapproved of the job Bush was doing, and these are data from the first uh, summer of each of these presidents' term in office, um, I mean, Reagan polarized people, rich and poor, had very different views of President Reagan. But rich and poor did not have very different views of George W. Bush, at least uh, early on. Um, and despite my impressions um, as sort of just someone who lived through that era um, of what Bush administration policies were like, in fact, many of the policies that were adopted, including the most prominent, important ones, during the early years of George W. Bush's term um, were, in fact, very centrist, broadly popular policies. So things like No Child Left Behind, right, the Medicare drug benefit, his faith-based initiative, uh, stem cell research compromise um, that he adopted, which actually expanded the sort of range of stem cells that were eligible for federal funding. Uh, income and estate tax uh, changes were popular uh, across the board, uh, as I mentioned, um, even among the poor, and at least in the early years, the Afghan and Iraq wars. So when we think about that responsiveness that I showed you on the previous slide, in terms of these kinds of policies, um, it's not so crazy to think that there could have been a high degree of responsiveness, a strong association between the public's preferences and policy outcomes um, during those uh, early Bush years. All right, now I want to, so, so that sort of gives you some sense of like what was going on policy-wise that is consistent with those patterns of responsiveness. Um, but I want to turn now to the more systematic factors that explain variation in responsiveness across the years in my data set and which we can then use to see how much of the uh, sort of unusual circumstances of the Johnson and Bush years uh, can be accounted for. And the circumstances, uh, political conditions that I examine uh, in the book include uh, the year in the electoral cycle, right, so whether it's a presidential election year congressional election year or a non-election year. Um, gridlock, right, which is sort of how much policy is being adopted relative to what's on the policy agenda uh, in any given year. A change in the presidential partisan regime, which is just a fancy way of saying that the party of the president changes hands from one, part, from, you know, one party to the other. Um, and there's reasons to think that that may have an impact on the extent to which policy reflects popular preferences. And finally, the majority party seat advantage, as I suggested, uh, Bush came into office with a very narrow majority, and that may have had something to do with uh, the nature of the policies that were adopted during those times. All right, so the results from all of these analyses uh, are here on this uh, colorful uh, slide here. And uh, the size of the dots, represents the strength of the association uh, between preferences and policies for people at the 10th, 50th, and 90th income percentiles, as in the previous slides. And I've divided these policy conditions into like what I expected or found to be positive policies, meaning that they uh, were conditions, uh, po positive uh, conditions, meaning that, the, meaning that they were uh, you know, conditions where responsiveness was stronger and the link between preferences and policy was greater and the negative conditions, which are simply the opposite of those. So for example, in the first uh, row there on the top left, um, that represents the strength of that preference policy link during presidential election years. The row below it, congressional election years, 
And the three dots to the right, of which you may only be able to see one, but there's two very small dots there, um, represent the strength of the preference policy link during non-election years. If they have a dark halo around them, that means they're statistically significant, uh, so significantly different from zero. All right, so we see, as we might expect, and consistent with uh, other research, that during election years, presidential election years in particular, the policies government adopts are more consistent with the policies that the public wants. Not surprising, that's true across all income levels. And for the poor and the middle class, represented by the green and blue dots in this chart, um, it's really the only time when there's any uh, you know, significant evidence of uh, connection between what those uh, groups want and what the government does. And I should point out, as it says in blue on the top there, that this is again looking at issues where preferences diverge across income levels. Now, I would consider that on the one hand to be deeply troubling, right, that it takes the, an imminent election, right, to sort of force policymakers to pay attention to what the public wants. On the other hand, there's something encouraging about that as well, right, because it suggests that political, uh, you know, circumstances matter, right, that political structures do, to some degree at least, uh, have an effect of democratizing policymaking. And if that's true, given the political structures and the nature of elections that we have now, well, maybe there's some hope that reforming those structures can further enhance policy responsiveness and, uh, and reduce inequality in responsiveness. So at any rate, whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, um, you know, there's the glass. And, um, and it is presidential election years where you see by far uh, stronger associations between preferences and policies. All right, gridlock has a sort of counterintuitive result. Right? So people think of gridlock as depressing responsiveness to public preferences because the government has sort of less ability to respond to issues that the public considers important. But what I found in this analysis is that gridlock is even better at um, uh, suppressing the ability to get unpopular policies adopted than it is at suppressing uh, the ability to get popular policies adopted. Right, so gridlock works as a kind of filter and only the most popular policies where there's sort of the strongest political cost uh, to be borne in opposing them, those are the only policies that manage to get through the gridlock filter. And so periods in my data that have high levels of gridlock, less may be getting done and there may be more things that um, aren't being addressed that are important, but the things that are being done do tend to be more consistent with what a wider range of Americans uh, say they want. New partisan regimes, also um, consistent with previous research, um, uh, do tend to give uh, somewhat stronger, uh, give policies that are somewhat uh, more strongly related to public preferences. Um, uh, when a new party comes into power, um, you know, the policies may be more consistent with what the public wants because that's why it came into power, right? So think about, say, the Iraq War and the 2006 and 2008 elections. Um, so policies shift in a way that's more consistent with public preferences. Um, there's also arguments about how policies sort of drift over time as one party controls the government in a direction that's uh, more and more consistent with what that party prefers, but further and further away from the sort of, you know, median voter. Um, and the uh, change of partisan regime then starts to bring policy uh, back toward uh, what a majority of voters would prefer. So for whatever reason, um, I do find that in my data that um, new partisan regimes uh, do uh, produce greater levels of responsiveness. But again, as in all of these other cases, that responsiveness is greater to the affluent than it is to the middle class. And in this case, um, there's really no evidence of an in boost in uh, um, uh, responsiveness to the poor. All right, and then finally at the bottom we see the size of the seat advantage um, does make a difference. When the seat advantage of the majority party is small, responsiveness to the middle class and the affluent is greater uh, on the left side and on the right side um, uh, during periods when there's large seat advantage of one party or the other, we see virtually no responsiveness. Right? When parties have the ability they will pursue their own policy agendas and ignore the preferences even of affluent Americans uh, if they don't um, 
uh, uh, if they're not consistent with what uh, party uh, activists, uh, interest groups, and so on prefer. If we take the um, three factors of gridlock, seat advantage, and change in partisan regime into account statistically, we can account for all of the uniquely low uh, responsiveness during the Johnson years and for about half of the uniquely high uh, level of responsiveness uh, during the George W. Bush uh, administration. Now, that doesn't mean that those first relationships weren't reflecting what was really going on. They were, but this sort of explains at least part of why we see those low and high levels, respectively, um, of responsiveness. Right? The huge Democratic seat advantage in the 1960s right, allowed the Democrats to isolate themselves and insulate themselves from political pressure, pursue their own agenda, um, and, uh, and the opposite conditions under the, at least the early years of uh, George Bush's first term uh, produced the opposite result. Now, if this argument about these sort of fundamental um, systematic influences on policy responsiveness is correct, then what we ought to see is that when circumstances changed, uh, let's say under the Bush administration, uh, that the pattern of policy responsiveness should change as well, even though it was still President Bush that was in office. And to assess that, um, what I've done is to divide the data that I have from the Bush years into 2001 and 2002, where Congress, as I said, very evenly divided and uh, control was uncertain, with 2005 and 2006. So the first two years of his first term compared to the first two years of Bush's second term when the Republicans had strong control of both houses of Congress. And what we see is that the change in political circumstances led to a dramatic decline in responsiveness. So in 2001 and 2, you see this is just the size of the dots or the height of the bars expressed in numbers here, um, high levels of responsiveness uh, for across all the income groups as the first chart that I showed you uh, revealed. But when we look then at 2005 and 6, we see responsiveness to all income levels much, much lower, something that resembles much more what we saw in the Johnson years uh, under unified democratic control. Now, of course, other things changed between 2005 and 6, uh, 2001 and 2 and 2005 and 6. Uh, in addition to uh, the strength of the Republican uh, control in Washington. Um, and I was particularly concerned that the declining popularity of the Iraq War um, or um, other aspects of the War on Terror may have influenced this. So I reran this analysis, but excluding all the questions that had to do with Iraq or the War on Terror, and found the same thing, that um, the relationship was somewhat lower in both time periods. Um, but still a quite strong relationship uh, in comparison to earlier presidents in 2001 and 2, and actually no evidence, no statistically significant relationship um, between preferences and policies in 2005 and 6. All right, so what can we conclude from uh, this analysis of the link between public preferences and government policy? Well, first, that representational inequality is vast. Second, that responsiveness to the affluent seems possibly to have increased over time, as we saw on the slide of the presidents when we were looking at uh, policies where preferences diverge. Um, but this certainly has not been the case for the middle class or the poor. Pol uh, parties act like policy maximizers, right, when they have enough power to pursue their own agendas rather than any sort of broad group uh, among the public, certainly any broad uh, income uh, group, um, they will do that. Uh, and ignore uh, the preferences of, uh, of the public as best they can. And finally, that political circumstances matter, right? That things like a, an impending election, close division of Congress, and so on, make a very large difference in the extent to which policymakers adopt policies that are consistent with what the public wants. Now, of course, despite those changes, I never found any circumstances in which middle class Americans had as much influence as the affluent, or poor Americans as much influence as the middle class. So we're talking always about degrees of inequality here. I want to be clear about that. All right, how am I doing on time here? <laughs>
Okay. Um, I want to talk about like why the affluent have more influence. And um, I think what I'll do is, um, rather than show you all the evidence of this, because I want to leave enough time for questions, um, I'll simply assert um, uh, what I think the reason is. And, um, and, and of, of course, the most obvious thing is that they're the source of the money in politics. Right? They're the ones who contribute to candidates, to parties, to interest groups, and so on. And I think that absolutely is the reason. But there are other factors which could also be playing a role, maybe even a large role. And in the book, I go through a variety of these, and I'm happy to talk about more, but, um, but have ruled out um, all of these other possible factors, except for one. Um, so for example, I look at interest groups. Right, which you might think, all right, well, if interest groups share the preferences of affluent Americans, maybe it's really the power of interest groups that's generating this association, not the power of those actual uh, sort of subgroup of citizens. Um, so I have an analysis. I suggest that's not the case. Um, what about policymakers? They're affluent, right? Every member of Congress is in the 90th income percentile, and many of them are way, way, way above that, um, if not in income, but certainly in assets. And uh, so, so I take a look at that and argue that that's not uh, an explanation. Um, affluent Americans are more knowledgeable about politics. That's true, but I don't think that's the reason either. Um, they do vote more. They volunteer for political campaigns. They contact their representatives. That's true. Uh, but again, uh, the data suggests that that cannot explain um, why policy is more consistent with their preferences than with those of the middle class uh, or the poor. And finally, there's a, the possibility that affluent Americans of the sort that I'm looking at, people at, say, the 90th income percentile, actually don't have any more influence over policy than those at the bottom of the income distribution, but that they tend to agree more with the people who do have influence. And in the same way that interest groups could be sort of a hidden factor here, well, maybe it's people at the 99th or the 99.9th percentile who actually are the ones that are influencing government policy. I don't have measures of their preferences. And maybe if they agree more with people at the 90th percentile, then um, uh, the associations that I'm finding are really reflecting the influence of some uh, smaller group of Americans um, with yet more assets. Um, all right, what could we, whoops, let's, let's skip through here's the, uh, Evidence, we're going to skip that. What can be done? Um, this is, I'm sorry to say, a kind of a short slide. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of solutions. Maybe you'll have some others. Um, clearly, campaign finance reform has to be at the top of the list. Right? Anything that can be done to reduce the importance of money in politics and to shift the source of that money from the affluent downward um, to less well-off Americans uh, will help to ameliorate the kinds of representational inequalities um, that I've shown. There's a number of proposals along these lines, and states have sometimes taken uh, the lead in these kinds of reforms. Um, one of my favorite proposals, definitely my favorite proposal today, is the Grant and Franklin proposal. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but anything that's, that's feasible and that can shift the sources that politicians turn to for funding um, is certainly one important avenue. A second and somewhat related uh, strategy is to go after electoral reforms, which may not shift. Uh, campaign finance reform may have uh, impact on electoral competition, but there are other uh, techniques as well, other strategies that can be used that can increase electoral competition, which, as the analysis of the division of government suggests, is one factor which can potentially force uh, politicians to take a broader swath of the public into account in forming policies. And so things like nonpartisan districting, nonpartisan get out the vote drives have been shown to increase the competitiveness of elections and, um, and in particular increase the ability of challengers uh, to defeat incumbents. And then finally, um, another strategy, kind of an end around strategy, is to focus on those policies where uh, they are beneficial to the less well off, but garners support from a broader uh, range of Americans, where there's um, support among the affluent for things like raising the minimum wage, uh, funding for education, and so on. And let me finally close by saying 
why I think we should care about this. Not that I think you need convincing, but I mean, clearly, these kinds of representational inequalities are important because they impact the policies that our government adopts and consequently influence the lives of less and well-off Americans in myriad important ways. But they're also important because they influence how we think about how we understand our government. Right? They influence the degree to which the public trusts or mistrusts its government and the degree to which citizens think it's worthwhile right, to engage in politics and try to change policy outcomes. So I spent many years collecting data, but it appears that most poor and middle class Americans came to the same conclusions that I did uh, without the benefit of this painstaking work. And when people were asked on a survey whether public officials care much about what people like them think, the majority of people at the bottom and middle of the income distribution said no, uh, but uh, people with uh, high incomes uh, were much more sanguine about that as this book suggests they were right to be. So thank you and I'll take questions. So I'll control the queue, just uh, signal to me and I'll put you on the list. Why don't we start here with Jenny? Jenny? Yeah. Me first? Okay. Um, two uh, slightly different questions. One is, so suppose we were to substitute instead of 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile substitute education. Mm. Um, how would that look? And presuming that you've maybe controlled for that in a separate regression, what, um, what do the sizes look like relative to the income? And the okay. second, qu second okay. question is, um, I was really struck also by the bar chart of the different responsiveness across um, administrations. And I wonder, the alternative hypothesis is some administrations are better at selling their policies to the public than others. And I wonder what kind of evidence that you have to support that alternative great. hypothesis. Okay, yeah. Two great questions, and, um, and I'm glad you asked them both because I can address them both with the same data, which um, I actually have and skipped over. So, um, so income versus education, uh, they're both uh, related in the way you'd expect. I mean, first of all, they're of course related to each other, but even independently of each other, people, uh, the preferences of people at the top of the education distribution are more closely related to government policy outcomes than those at the bottom of the education distribution, just as they are for income. But if we take both education and income into account, which I've done here, um, then we find that it's income, which is considerably a more powerful moderator of the link between preferences and policies. So the three income levels are in the green, blue, and red bars reflecting the low, middle, and high income levels. And the education percentiles go from front to back, from low to high education. And as you can see, as you go from left to right, the strength of the preference policy link gets stronger right, across income percentiles at every level of education to a much greater degree than does the um, strength of the link across income percentiles from the front to the back of that chart. Okay, so they both matter, but income matters more uh, in this analysis. And so why is that an uh, answer to both questions? It's an answer to both questions because to the extent that um, what we're seeing here is uh, elites, administrations, or others uh, convincing the public that they should support the policies that those elites want to pursue rather than the influence of some subgroup of the public on elites, um, to the extent that it, the uh, causal connection is going sort of from elites to the public, we would think that that relationship would be stronger with education because it's the education that's the strongest correlate of political knowledge, interest, and engagement. Those are the people at the top of the education distribution who are paying the most attention to politics. And to the extent that income seems to be a more important predictor of responsiveness, um, that suggests that influence is flowing uh, from the public up. There's other evidence as well. So for example, um, work on uh, the relationship between presidential popularity and the uh, association between what 
po what policies presidents pursue and uh, what the public wants, suggests um, that that link is strongest, that the president's policies are, let's say, most popular, um, not at the times when the president is most popular, which is what you might expect if presidential popularity, if the president was influencing the public, but instead that link is strongest uh, in times uh, with elections looming, and especially elections where the outcome is uncertain. Okay, so very different kind of data from uh, others' analysis. Um, but that's also consistent with this notion that the link between preferences and policies, at least to some very substantial degree, is flowing upward from the public, although based on my analysis, upward from a very narrow segment of the public uh, under most conditions. Okay, so we have a very long queue now. Oh, um, dear. Francis. Um, yep. This? Okay. Um, so uh, I want sort of clarification. Uh, I'm a philosopher, so uh, you, you'll take that. You'll see I need a lot of clarification. So um, philosophers uh, typically distinguish between um, equality achieved by leveling down and equality by increase uh, of a good, right? So when the party has a lock on votes, you know, if there's a strong uh, majority for one party, uh, influence became equal. Nobody had any. Right. So obviously we're not just interested, or you're not just interested in equality. You want positive correlation between uh, 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 desire for something on the part of the population and what the public does. Not just equality, okay, so positive. So the thing is that, suppose that I want, um, you know, uh, everybody to actually vote for Democrats. So Democrats get this big majority in the House, right? Presumably, the reason I want everybody to vote for Democrats is because I think their agenda, the policies they will vote in, are what I approve of. And if they get the votes and their policies actually reflect you know, what I thought they would seek, it seems odd to think that their policies are not at least reflective of what the public wants because the public gave them a big majority. I can see that they might not be responsive to the public. There's no causal connection anymore between the public wants it, we'll give it to them. But nevertheless, their policies, it seems, should coincide with what the public wants. So responsiveness is a causal notion, but reflection is not. And I'm just wondering why it's the case that if you voted, a large number of people voted in the Democrats for their policies and their agenda is constant with what expectations were, their policies would be unpopular. If their policies are not unpopular, then it's not clear to me that responsiveness matters, the causal connection, because they're reflective, right? And on the other hand, it seems to me ultimately what matters, this is the third part, is whether the interests of the people are being recognized rather than whether their preferences are. Uh, which may go back to one of the things that you didn't want to discuss. So maybe the Democrats get in by saying we're going to do something, and then they go back on their word, but they're actually pursuing the interests of the population. This could apply to Republicans too, I'm just picking the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, in some deep sense, it doesn't matter whether there's responsiveness or reflection if interests are taken care of. So okay. I've got a lot of questions there, I'm there sorry. Is, but yes. No, there, uh, Thank you. Very nice questions. Um, some of them very philosophical. And um, uh, so I guess what I'd say in terms of like, well, how can it be that if a party is voted into power, that their policies, by a majority, that their policies aren't consistent with what the public wants? And part of the answer is that, uh, you know, even when Democrats are, even when there's like a, you know, landslide election, there's very large numbers of people that didn't vote for the uh, losing party, or that didn't vote for the winning party, they did vote for the losing party, and that um, there are also <coughs> large numbers of people that didn't vote at all, of course. And moreover, that once the party is in power, um, the, the evidence shows that they will pursue the policies that they care about, not that their constituents who voted for them care about, until the time of the next election, when they start to worry a little bit more about what the public wants. So things like, you know, the unpopular policies uh, during the uh, Johnson years um, are reflective, some of those policies, of things that, you know, the Democrats thought it would be good for the country to have a more open immigration policy. But the people who voted for the Democrats didn't think so. 
Well, the Democrats didn't need to pay attention to the, their constituents in that sense, um, and they didn't. Um, so uh, there's a lot more to be said, but. Um, or at least their opinion of the interests as opposed to what preferences are. Yeah, I mean, I think the question of whether the parties are pursuing what they believe to be in some more sort of philosophical sense, like the greater good of the whole, I, I think that's an open question and not one that I'm an expert at, though I, I'm a little more cynical than that. But, um, uh, but, there, but it's clear that they're not pursuing in a majoritarian way the people who voted uh, them into office. And whether they should do that or not, like whether we want you know, representation to reflect what people say like on surveys, I think that's a very difficult, complicated question. And as you know, people have been debating it for a couple thousand years. And um, I, I don't think I have anything specially valuable to add at this point. <laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, thank you. Dan, can you use, can you use your mic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, fascinating and unexpected. Um, so a lot to think about. Uh, my question is uh, as follows, I think, uh, on uh, Francis's about the interest preferences uh, question. Um, it certainly was striking that, that Bush um, seemed to hit his groove with everybody. Uh, and I was trying to think, well, what, what would be an alternative explanation? So let me float one out and see whether you think your data are consistent with it. So but, uh, what if... Um, Karl Rove or some other uh, genius guru in the Republican Party had mastered uh, the art of finding themes um, which, although strongly in the interest of the well-to-do, resonated beautifully with the uh, aspirations, hopes, and illusions <laughs> of everybody else. And the perfect example is the sta estate tax, which um, I mean, if ever there was a, a policy where it's manifestly against the interests of most of the people who supported it, that would be it. Uh, but we, you know, the popular understanding of why why poor people think it's very important not to tax estates is that when they become a billionaire, they want to keep their money. Um, so uh, if 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 the whoever's designing these themes keeps hitting them like that, I mean that's fantastic. Then you can get this unanimous support and and yet be strongly um, geared toward the the top. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. Um, so so part of um, you know, the art of governing, right, is finding things that you can succeed at, which in some cases may mean finding things that are popular if you're in a situation where there's strong incentives to appeal uh, to the public. Um, but that will advance your preferences, your values, your interests. And I think the estate tax is a great example there. Um, uh, although uh, I think it's a little more complicated than that, that um, people, even people who didn't expect to ever benefit from it still opposed the estate tax. And I think they did that on sort of value, uh, sort of fairness grounds. Um, there's you know, strong, and, and there's been for decades uh, in, in surveys, um, strong sense that people should be able to pass down to their heirs you know, some sort of rightfully earned uh, assets um, without the government taking a slice. I don't agree with that. You may not agree with that. but. Large majority of Americans do. Um, so, but that, but but I agree that I mean that was a brilliant example, a brilliant choice, um, and at a time when the Democratic Party, which had served in previous years as um, the sort of bulwark against the elimination of the estate tax, kind of like, you know, for reasons that we can talk about in terms of like why is it that the affluent have more influence now, um, as the Democratic Party dropped their uh, opposition to that. Um, we saw, oh, not only under Bush, but under uh, previous administrations as well, uh, lessening of the estate tax. So I, so I think you're right, and I think you're right also in suggesting that in the broad sweep of things, if Rove or whomever uh, is good at identifying those kinds of policies that are politically feasible or popular, um, but which only advance one sort of subgroup's interests, then we're going to see policy move in a way that advances that subgroup's interest. And I don't know what the answer to that is, other than that there has to be an opposition party. And if neither of the parties are really representative of the interests of less well off, then we're, just, we're not going to see those kinds of policies adopted. And arguably, that's to a large extent what we have seen or not seen. Michael. So I wanted to ask you to say a little bit more 
about why you think that it's the um, funding uh, differences that explain the variations rather than the sort of political power independent of funding hypothesis that you briefly touched upon. And so I was going to ask uh, you to get at that by saying more about um, the finding that presidential elections were the sort of period where um, responsiveness across all income levels was the greatest. And so I was wondering what time frame did that presidential elect, uh, election consider? Was it the time leading up to the election where you might intuitively think that campaign financing is at its highest level? Or was it the time after that where you, th you might think that the pressure to live up to your pledges during the campaign was highest? I'm not sure which way this would cut, but I was just curious if you would say more about um, what exactly um, the presidential election event um, consisted of time-wise uh, and how that might compare with levels in donation. Um, so the period of time, I mean, unfortunately, these data are not as finely grained and there's, despite a decade's worth of data collection and analysis, not enough of them to really distinguish between what happens in a few month periods and there's not enough presidential elections. Um, so. What I showed you were uh, policies adopted in the year of a presidential election. So for the most part, that means prior to the election. Um, and of course, prior to the new president taking office, if there was a new president. So I interpret that as reflecting um, the influence of an upcoming election on the policies that Congress and the president adopt. Um, and in terms of the first part of your question about sort of alternative sources of influence, I'm not sure exactly what other like political uh, sources of power you are referring to. I mean, I mentioned things like voting and volunteering. So, um, okay, so uh, I have a slide for that as well. And that um, basically the argument here is that the affluent do participate at higher rates in politics in those sorts of ways. And I will find my slide in a second, there it is. Um, but the pattern that fits representation is the money pattern, right? So if you look at like turnout in the upper left, it's true the affluent vote at a slightly higher rate than the middle class, but not much. The real difference is with the poor. Similarly with things like working in a political campaign, the biggest differences are between the middle class and the poor, and yet the biggest differences in the responsiveness of policymakers is between the affluent and everybody else. So that's one piece of evidence. There's others that other, um, other kinds of analyses um, that's kind of consistent with that notion that these kinds of, if you will, sort of retail level uh, political engagement, things like contacting your representative, working in a campaign, and voting um, are not uh, the explanation for differential responsiveness. So you guys have a one-two punch right here. <laughs> yes, right here, you first. Yep, yep, oh, yep. yep. Okay. Oh. I'm interested in whether your analysis suggests that, that things that are called to our attention in the way things are presented in the media are distracting us from the real uh, uh, real going on. So if you look if you look at television, I, I don't know that the public is very often, but I look at blogs and the newspapers, and you very often see this picture of the United States divided into red states and blue states. And if you if you look at voting on some of the issues that are dividing country at the moment, but you things like health care and um, stimulus, uh, pursuing sh st stimulus versus so worrying about the deficit, when you look at who, who are the senators or who are the representatives that are strongly lined up, it tends to, tends to correlate you know, to a fairly high degree with that, with that divide. Um, now those seem to me to be issues that at least the interests of the, real, <laughs> of the, of the more affluent and the less affluent are, are sharply at odds with one another. Now maybe you'll tell me their preferences aren't, but that, that's, uh, that's the thought. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so it looks like you've got a divide there that's, a, that's not necessarily an income uh, divide. If, 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 the, if politics change in one part of the country, but we have a big shift, uh, it looks like, on one of these rather than the other. So, so your analysis may suggest that that's an illusion. We shouldn't be thinking in these terms. But, but there's an underlying fact, it's like maybe what's going on in the, in the red states is that the, although there are a lot of poor people in those states, 
that, that the wealthy in those states have an even better lock <laughs> on the political process <laughs> than, than the wealthy in, 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 in the other states. So your phenomenon might, might be a sort of explanation of what's going on here. But anyway, do you have a view about, about uh, the importance of the divide you're talking about as compared to these divides that might be called to our attention by the kind of political analysis that we all agree on? Uh, wow. That's a tough question. I mean, I don't think what I'm saying here, of course, is the only thing that goes on or the only important thing that goes on. It's, I think you know, these other kinds of divisions can be critically important. Um, I do agree with uh, the premise of your question that the way these divides are presented in the media are often misleading and arguably distracting. Um, the country is not a red state, blue state country. I mean, most people on most issues are in the middle, and that has not changed. So the parties have become polarized, and if you look at analyses of Congress, you'll see that where there used to be moderates in both parties, now there's virtually no moderates in either party. Um, but that's not true for the public as a whole. And um, there's even people who do these kinds of mapping uh, exercises and that argue that, well, what we really need is like shades of purple. And they produce maps that show a very different looking country. And it's true, there's more liberal sections and more conservative sections, but this sort of division um, is misleading. And um, uh, so, so yes, yeah, so I guess I would agree. Well, it's a little southern strategy made a big difference. To, 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 it, it, that was an important causal factor in shifting, shifting things to the right. But, but, but I, I don't know how that, it, maybe that isn't true, but that, I don't know whether that squares with it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is true. Um, I mean, it's not the only thing that went on. But um, because there's a, um, a high degree of partisan uh, coherence uh, in Congress, that the fact that if you, whether you have a Democrat or a Republican representative from the same state makes a huge difference. So even though many states, most states, are somewhere in the middle, there are, you, know, you may have like a representative, one, repre one senator from one party and another senator from the other party, and they vote with their parties, even though they're representing the exact same people. So I think that's another example of that kind of phenomenon where a actually sort of centrist country ends up uh, producing a very uh, polarized Congress. Yes, um, the question that jumped out at me. Uh, I'm sorry, we, just so we can get it recorded, can you just press your button and hold it down? The press, uh, question that jumped out at me was the one that uh, Francis raised about the relationship between interests and preferences, um, which, and so I. My question to you is whether you have an aversion to talking about interests because it's harder to measure or something like that, um, or there might be more controversy about what measures are as opposed to uh, simply measuring preferences. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the picture I had is that uh, if you look at that slide you gave from the Johnson period where there was a pursuit of less popular policies along with some that were popular. Um, uh, I would argue um, from my perspective that the, all the policies nevertheless captured the interests of the poor or, or the mm -hmm. lower middle class. Okay. Well, let me, um, let me respond to that in a, as a way of responding to your first question. Um, and, and I think you're exactly right in suggesting why I'm reluctant to talk about interests, that they are hard to assess, they're hard to measure, and that we have a strong tendency, I think, to impose our understanding of what someone else's interests are in ways that may or may not be consistent with their own understanding. Um, and so to take a, an example from the Johnson years, something like um, immigration policy. Is that a good thing for poor Americans to have a looser immigration policy? I mean, poor Americans prefer that. A lot of economists would say, no, those are exactly the people who are being heard. It's great for affluent Americans to have a more open immigration policy. Um, but it's a controversial question, right? And that's sort of the point. And it's not to say that that shouldn't be addressed. I think that's a terribly important question. But it's a very different kind of question. And it's not one that's sort of easily incorporated into the kind of analysis that I'm doing that's looking at the extent to which people are able to influence the government to do what they want, even in those cases where we might think they want the wrong thing. Um, you right here. Yeah. Thanks for being here tonight, Professor. Um, I do believe that the, uh, the people with the money 
are the people with the power, uh, disproportionately. Um, if I understand correctly, um, you weren't really able to include the, uh, the top 9 or 10% in the income distribution uh, in the country. And I was just curious as to uh, why you were unable to obtain that data and also um, how you think that that might have affected your, your findings had you uh, been able to collect it. Okay. Um, so the, um, the problem is that if you want to know what a very small group of people think, you need a very large survey or you need a survey that specifically targeted those kind of people. And um, if you wanted to know, say, what the top 1% or 2% of Americans feel about some issue, you can't find out with a typical survey that has 1,500 respondents to it, um, even if the people at that income level were willing to take the survey. Um, there's other problems in that, like typical surveys don't actually tell you who's in the top 1%. They usually have some income category that says like $100,000 and above, and some of those people might be rich and some of them are just merely affluent. So, so the data don't exist. Um, they will never exist for earlier periods, but there are people who are trying to gather that kind of information um, by targeting very rich Americans and throwing a lot of resources at uh, survey uh, organizations to like find those people and get them to agree. So we may have more information about it. Um, how it would change would be, how it might change my results uh, would be if the preferences of those people differ in important ways from the preferences of the people I'm looking at at the 90th percentile. And you could imagine what sorts of issues those might be, right? things like you know carried interest uh, or something along those lines, um, or maybe things having to do with business regulation because more of the people at the very top are business owners or reliance on um, uh, you know, the well-being of businesses. But, um, but that's speculation at this point. We don't really know. Can I, can I ask, just inter interject a question? So, um, obviously, you've been spending the last 10 years looking at American data. Has anybody been doing an equivalent analysis in other democracies to see whether we see a similar pattern? Yeah, no, not really, unfortunately. Are you going to do that? Nope. <laughs> um, I mean, okay. I, I barely know enough about America to pull this off, and I certainly don't know enough about other countries. But it, it's a gargantuan task, and it would also require, of course, a lot of attention to like the similarities that you, you, know, you want to make sure that the set of policies you're asking about are equivalent, which isn't even necessarily the same policies. So it, it's a very challenging task. I'm not sure I understand that. All I'm saying is if you did the same kind of analysis, which would be basically to take all of the surveys for that country and take the half that are actually a conflict between the top and the bottom, and there wouldn't have to be an equivalent between those questions and what Americans care about. Would, they wouldn't have to be. In fact, you wouldn't want them to be the same questions, but you would want some assurance that the universe of survey questions that organizations in one country chose to ask about were in some yeah. way comparable yeah. to those in the US. Yeah. Okay, um, right here. Um, I, I was wondering, I guess most of the policies that you spoke about were uh, policies um, implemented on the federal level, and, I would, and you also mainly looked at it uh, just presidential support, and I was wondering if you also did this analysis at the level of congressional support, um, and whether congressional uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, the ways in which Congress members um, implement policies or uh, like votes that occur on the level of Congress are more reflective of their district's um, policy preferences and how it might change based on that level of analysis. And then also I was wondering if your surveys um, included questions about specific policies. So for example, like the no child Le whether you asked about No Child Left Behind or whether you simply asked about kind of educational funding because um, that's not necessarily, those aren't necessarily reflective of the same thing. Okay, so um, first the clarification, which is that um, the policies that I was, uh, what I was looking at was policy outcomes, which um, typically w would, in order for it to be adopted, would require both the President and Congress, um, although some of these policies were things that could be done by executive uh, action alone. Um, and, um, but to the substance of your question about uh, how different representatives uh, might vote, 
Um, I haven't done that, but my former colleague, Larry Bartels, uh, did um, exactly that kind of analysis. He looked at senators voting uh, across a number of different issues and the preferences expressed by their state's residents at low, middle, and high levels of income and found a very similar pattern. So it's always nice when you get some kind of very different analysis, but nevertheless corroborates uh, the same basic pattern uh, of responsiveness to people at the top and not at the bottom. Um, and um, oh dear, no, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second part of that question. About whether the survey, the surveys asked about broader, oh, yes. about specific policies so or there broader. Is, yeah, so in, in general, they do ask about specific, pretty specific policies, and they had to be specific enough to code with confidence whether that thing that was a proposed change occurred. But there was a range, and some of them were broader, and some of them might be, for example, you know, would you favor or oppose raising the minimum wage? And another question might be, would you favor or oppose raising the minimum wage to $6.75? And so I have a range of questions, and I discuss in the book the advantages and disadvantages of having a range of questions, but they, they all had to be specific enough that you could code with confidence that that thing either occurred or didn't occur. Max. Nice talk, lots of surprises. Can you go back to the other chart you had with education and wealth? Sorry. I know it's there. There we go, okay. Uh, so uh, my, my eyeballs suggest that there's an interaction there. Mm -hmm. So you commented on the, the comparative strengths of main effects. I'm wondering, am I, is, is, are my eyeballs correct in, um, in terms of the statistical analysis and I'm curious as to what you would make of that. It certainly seems yeah. like education matters a whole lot more the less well off you are. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, mean, I, I don't know um, why that is. Um, it's, one could speculate that some people with low incomes and high educations are uh, forming their policy preferences, at least in part, on the basis of their expected future incomes. Um, you know, I, I haven't looked in more depth at you know, who those people are, if those are like young people, um, you know, sort of starting off in careers or, or what. Um, there is a relationship between age and education, so that may be part of it. Um, but, but I think you're quite right. Um, uh, education seems to matter little uh, if you have a lot of money, um, but it does seem to matter a lot more uh, if you don't. And we have a last question, you at the... Yeah, uh, yeah uh, actually it's very similar to a few of the questions that the philosophers asked, uh, so you may have already covered it a little uh, bit. <laughs> um, but the question is basically, um, how might you address a skeptic who asks you why uh, we should care about the, um, responsive, the responsiveness of government policies to the subjective preferences of income groups as opposed to caring whether uh, the government's policies are objectively good? Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a tough question. Um, I, I wouldn't expect, I mean, this is one of the tensions of democracy, right? M most people want to live in a democratic society, um, but they also want the government to do what they think is best. And in the, so that's sort of the individual version of the question you asked, right, which is as a society, which should we prefer? Um, and, and I don't think there's an easy answer there. Um, I mean, the, obviously the, uh, the, the problem, right, with saying like, well, government should do what's best is identifying what's best. And, um, and I don't know if asking the people is the right way. It's, uh, clearly, I don't always agree with what you know, the people uh, answer um, when they're asked, at least when they're asked in these ways. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, what's the alternative? Like there, there has to be some important role for the preferences of the public um, and probably some mechanisms for uh, ignoring those preferences when uh, it seems that it would you know, harm to the country would result. But that's, uh, that's too tough of a question for me to answer. Okay, please join me in thanking. Thank you.